Okay, I have uh, 5.30 on my clock. So with that, I would like to convene this meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Board of Directors for November 4th. Holly, would you like to call the roll, please? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Henry. Here. Director Ackman. Here. By this Director Falls. <laughs> Sure. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Staff has none, sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Do we have any uh, members of the public here? We do. We do have um, people and I just want to, so this is where we have the oral communications from the public on items that are on the closed session agenda. Um, you, you might have mistakenly signed on thinking that this was the open session. Um, so for example, if you're here about Big Basin, that session starts at 630. Um, but if you do have a comment that you would like to make about the items that are on the closed session, please uh, raise your hand, uh, hitting the raise your hand button at the bottom. Okay, hearing none, seeing none, um, then we will um, adjourn to closed session and see you guys back in a few minutes. For anybody else that is still on this uh, uh, meeting, they will be back at 630. And in the meantime, um, I'll just be sitting here or in the general area. Thank you. Okay, let's see. I think we have everybody here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have 630. So I'd like to convene this open session of the November 4th meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, there are no actions to report out of closed session. Um, and can you now take the role, Holly, for this open part of the session? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Henry. Here. Director Ackerman. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Um, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Rick? Uh, staff has none. Okay, and I don't have any. So we'll go on to oral communications. This is the portion of the agenda that's reserved for oral communications from the public on any subject that lies within the jurisdiction of the district that is not on tonight's um, agenda. Is there anybody that would like to make a comment? I see uh, Larry Ford, you have your hand up. Um, please go ahead, we'll allow you to speak and go ahead. Okay, you should be fine now. Thank you. This is Larry Ford. It's the Thanksgiving season, so I just want to say thank you to all the board members and staff and committee members for uh, enduring a really complicated and challenging 2021. And also, I want to congratulate you all for surviving another fire season. And so it, it looks like we were very well prepared for this fire season, but it didn't turn out to be as uh, as dangerous and catastrophic as we all thought it might be. So thank sure. you and happy holidays. Well, thank you for those good wishes, Larry. And yes, we're all very, very relieved that 
um, the end of the fire season is here. It, would anybody else like to address the board? Okay, if not, uh, there is no president's report. We will now go to old business. And the first item is the water master plan. Rick? Yes, and I'll ask our, our district engineer. I'm very happy to ask our district engineer to present this item to the board. And we do have a, a guest speaker tonight. Thanks, Rick. Good evening, everyone. As Rick mentioned, we do indeed have a presentation from Tony Ackle of Ackle Engineering, who is the consultant who has developed our master plan. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tony for his presentation, and then we will take questions after. Tony, take it away. That's awesome. Thank you, Josh. Um, would you like me to present from this side? The PowerPoint? Please do. Yes. CTV should make Tony a presenter. There we go. Can, can you see that? Yes, we see it, Tony. You're seeing a presentation or are you seeing a movie? Because I'm playing a movie on the other screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, giving us this opportunity, uh, President Mahoud, the directors. Um, it, was, it has been a pleasure for our firm to, and, and an honor to have uh, been selected and working on this uh, very important project for uh, the district. Uh, this is presentation is, um, is, is uh, summarizing the effort uh, over the past uh, couple of years. We actually started before the pandemic and the pandemic uh, put us on a pause for a little bit, and then we continued. Um, so what is the water master plan? Uh, let's see here, let me make sure I can advance the slide. Maybe if I do it here. Not working or not? There, okay. All right, there's a pause. Um, so what is the objective of a water master plan? So what is it? How do we use it? And then the second item on the agenda is how uh, it was developed. So what does it include? And how, how was it developed? Um, the first of all, what is it and how to use it? It's a document that identifies the water system improvements to service existing users, to service growth, of course. And then these improvements, we have to quantify them. What do we need? quantify that, and then prioritize them. We don't have all the money in the world to fix everything. So can we prioritize them so we can um, start spending our money's best, uh, best bang for the buck, spend our money where we need to spend them first. And, and it includes costs. So we do provide estimated costs. How do we use it? Well, the master plan, the most important element of the master plan, it's, it's a, is that it is a defensible guiding document for capital improvement projects, for planning purposes and for budgeting purposes. Um, I'm always asked, what is the most important thing about a master plan? It has to be defensible because we have, we identify improvements that need to be fixed when it has a lot of costs in it. And so it has to be defensible. How, what, how does it, what does it include and how did we develop it? Um, um, it, the, the slide uh, lists about 10 items. Uh, first one is characterizing land use. Of course, we base it on land use. Uh, we base it on existing customers. We base it on land use. And of course, it has demands. We have to quantify how much are our current customers using water, where are they using water, when are they using water, um, and how is that water traveling in pipeline? Um, and to know what, how it's traveling in pipelines, number three is inventory. Where are our pipelines? What size are they? Uh, what conditions, if you know, are they? Uh, number four was the hydraulic model. This project was based on evaluating the system using electronic tools. A model is a, is a computer program that uh, allows us to see how water travels inside pipelines. It allows us to see uh, the pressures that we expect in certain areas at certain times. And, and that was a very large investment by your staff. And that tool is available for, for use in the future. 
that kudos for for making this big investment. Uh, then no, number five, it's called calibrate. Calibrate means making sure that the model is similar to reality. Just because it's on a computer doesn't make it right. We want to make sure that it is predicting what what we see in the field. So that's the step that is also important. And then when we have that tool at, in our fingertips, then the fun begins. Now let's see, let's take our system to a spin. Let's see, you know, where are the bottlenecks? How can we make it better? That's what it's about. And then when we know how do we make it better, then number seven is recommend the improvement. What are the improvements? List them out, show it to us on a map. Uh, and number nine is develop a so-called capital improvement program, which means costs. How much would they cost? And number 10, we're here for number 10. All right. So number one, characterizing land use. So this is a map on the right-hand side that shows the land use uh, in, in this district. Uh, there are about 5,677 acres existing. Existing means these are acres that are currently occupied. Future acres that are occupied, about 100 acres, not many areas uh, available for future growth. And the total is 5,700. Number two, how much water? These are some statistics and I won't go over too much of those, but in you know, 2013, our water we used on an annual basis, 2.1 million gallons. 2015, we used 1.57. In 2019, we used 1.74. So that's our range. This is how much we use as a district uh, in terms of annual use of water between 1.5 and 2 million gallons per day. Uh, maximum month, we use more. During the summer month, uh, July as an example, or August, we use a little bit more. So 2.9 as an example is a value that was used in 2013. Inventory. So the map on the right-hand side shows the, it shows our, our service area and it's color-coded. It's color-coded by so-called pressure zones. We have 35 pressure zones that we service. My apologies, the phone is ringing in the background and it's not close. Um, so there are about 190 miles of pipelines. Um, and this, that we have 55 tanks throughout that have about 9.626 million gallons of capacity. 33 booster station. Um, so it is noted, I mean, 35 pressure zones, that's a lot of pressure zones and kudos to your staff that have to maintain all that. A lot of storage tanks, 55 of them. And that's because it's a challenging terrain that we have here. And um, it's it, everyone is not in one area, it's spread out all over. And so it's a lot to maintain, it's a lot to uh, worry about. Mm. For mapping purposes, we, we broke the system into two plates so we can present them and talk about them a little bit more. And they are shown here. Um, the north, we called it the north plate that shows several pressure zones or several parts of the pipelines and the south pressure zone. Um, if I can make a note here, the, the transmission system, the pipelines where the, the 12 inches and larger are shown in red. And you don't see too many red pipelines. And um, the blue lines are eight inches and, and less, and then uh, smaller pipelines are in brown. Uh, one of the things that you will start um, we'll start talking about is undersized uh, pipelines. We have we have observed a lot of undersized pipelines in the system, so there's a lot of opportunities for enhancement. I mentioned we use the hydraulic model or a computer software program. What does it look like? That's what it looks like. On the left hand side, if you heard about GIS, you can it works layering system. So at any one time, we can, as an example, bring aerial photography behind it when we want to. Uh, at any one time, we can you know, not show anything else except the pipelines. When we're doing analysis, we just show pipelines. In this case, we're color coding it based on pressure zones. So you see big steel, you see lion on the left, reader on top and blackstone. When we analyze, it gives us a lot of tools. On the right-hand side, it's a database. So all those pipes has, have information, the size of the pipeline, uh, the length of the pipeline, friction, in the pipeline that we expect. So it's a lot of information that help us analyze. So it's just intended to show what it looks like. This is your investment that you'll be able to use 
very effectively in the future, continue to use effectively. Uh, and then we said, we want to make sure that the model, this model, this tool that is on a computer is predicting what the field, what we're observing in the field. And so those graphs that you see show two colors, a red line, and it shows a blue line. The, the, the blue line is what, we, what we've measured in the field. We installed, your staff installed, you know, monitors in the field that was picking up pressure, constantly picking up pressure between, that was just before the pandemic, November and December of 2019. And those were picked up and we compared them to how we were simulating on the computer. And so the red is the actual simulation from the model. And when we, the two coincide, we're saying now the model is predicting, you know, reality. Now we can run a lot of what if, show me what happens in summertime, show me what happens in wintertime, show me what happens if this pipeline is, is, is broke, we bro it was, was broken. If we take this tank out of service to, um, to paint it, as an example, what happens to the system? What are we going to do about it? How can we enhance operations? So we use the, this model to, to do evaluate the pipelines. Can they meet fire flow requirements? Um, what about pressures? Do we have adequate pressures throughout the system where we have customers? The storage tanks, do we have enough water that can fight fires if we want them or, or, or can provide them with operation? But if we have a fire that we want with a specific duration, can we fight that fire? And finally, you know, we. We have to send water uphill through boosters. Boosters force that water uphill. Uh, when we force it uphill, do we have enough capacity to force it up to the tank maybe, or to the customers? So now we're looking at some maps, color-coded, that show the pipelines, but it shows you know, round circles. Those round circles are telling us pressures. Uh, uh, what, the, what the pressure, in this case, it's telling us um, available fire flow. How much do we are we expecting to get in terms of fire flows, fighting fire flow? The map on the left shows a lot of red. Red means, if you could see the legend on the lower left, less than 500 gallons per minute. What we would like to get in residential areas is, as an example, I think it is a thousand gallons. Uh, correct, it's a thousand gallons for two hours. And in multifamily, we like to get 1,500 gallons per minute. And in commercial areas, we'd like to get 2,000 gallons per minute. So that would be, you know, we'd like to get green in commercial areas. We'd like to get yellow in multifamilies. Um, and we would like to get, you know, or, or, or almost 1,000 gallons per minute. So orange, we want to see orange in residential areas. But look how many red dots we have. And the reason for that is because our pipelines are not large enough. Uh, and that's what this effort was about, identifying what do we need to do to get to, get to that next step. We can't fix it all overnight, but we need to start working towards that. Uh, so that the plate on the left is telling us the minimum fire flow residual pressure. So this is the minimum flows we can get as a snapshot in time. The, 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 the map on the right tells us the same thing but we want to make sure that the tank has enough water, not that we're meeting that fire for about five minutes. We want to meet that fire for two hours. And if we don't meet that fire for two hours, show us some more, more red dots that we can't meet that fire for two hours. All right. And so to show recommended improvements, we would like to show them, we like to show them on plates and in and, and, and more detail. And this is uh, figure seven, seven is all, all these figures are in the master plan, by the way. I just, uh, we just selected a few to talk about. And um, so all the improvements are shown. This is a key map, figure seven, seven. And the one on the right shows a typical detail. In this case, it's detail C. And it shows pipelines in red are the improvements that we are recommending. We're also showing the size of those pipelines. The pipelines, if you look at the legend on the lower left, those that are color coded in orange, those are improvements required to meet fire flow requirements. Not just capacity, not just sending water to serve residents, but fighting fires. So we have those two isolated uh, or, or identified differently. 
And these are two more plates, in this case, detail E and detail F. We selected two more representative to show you that there are lots of pipelines. As I mentioned, the system is undersized. A uh, lot of small pipelines, four inches and six inches don't fight fires. Um, then we do, we went into another analysis because uh, this, this analysis is, is important to um, prioritize improvement. Um, we don't have all the money in the world to fix the system. Our system is aging and needs to be at one point in time uh, re replaced or renewed. So how do we determine where do we start? Where, what's the best bang for the buck for that? It's a, it's a process called risk assessment that we use. It's a different analysis where we look at every pipeline and we assign it a risk from extreme risk to very low risk. And those extreme risks are color coded in red. So the map on the right hand side shows you those that we assigned as extreme risk. Extreme risk means they have a lot of flows, it means we, have, we cannot afford to have them break on us. That's why they would be extreme risks. And we want to make sure that they don't fail. Uh, these are the, because they have high consequence if they fail. If it's a pipeline serving one or two residents, yes, we don't like that to happen. But the consequence of inconveniencing two residents until we can fix it is, is less than having a very large pipeline coming from a treatment plant or a, or a storage facility. And, and that has a high consequence. We don't want those to fail because this is a business. It has to be run as a business and lo lowering the risk is very important. We also looked at you know, saving and saving on energy, energy reliability and efficient efficiency analysis. We conducted that, we identified some improvements and your staff were, um, did not wait. They initiated some of those improvements and they can probably talk about those themselves. At the end of the day, how much? How much does it cost to take the system to the next level? Um, and it's not inexpensive. As I mentioned, there were a lot of pipelines that need to be enhanced. Um, and so you see at the end of the day in pipeline improvements, there are about $57 million. But yes, those include some contingencies. Um, we, don't, we cannot fix them today, but those are pipelines that we need to fix eventually, one of these days. So we have to come up with some plan and program and methods and means so we can start working on the system, taking it to the next level. This helps us go to the next level, reservoirs. Reservoirs, this is where how much we store water for emergency for daily use for fire flow. And we have identified that our storage is not sufficient and we need to um, you know, bring it up to par to meet fire flow requirement uh, and to meet the criteria that we have. And in terms of storage, we have about 17 million that we identified for a total, total of $75 million. It's a lot of money. But it's it's gonna be a plan that you works work, work, work toward. It's, it's intended to, help us with the budgets. Uh, on an annual budget between 2022 and 2027, uh, we're estimating 3.3 to 4.2 millions per year. So we have annual budgets for between 2022 and 2025. We also have five-year budget between 2027 and 2041, and they range between 10 millions to 4 millions every five years, which is equivalent to about 3 millions, um, two to 3 millions or, th or 4 millions per year. They don't have to be exact, uh, but that's what you would need for the next 20 years. That's the recommended budget that you would need for the next 20 years. And then let's say, and then finally, you know, a, a big element of this project was also to look at uh, improvements that are attributable to disadvantaged communities. Uh, and the, 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 the table on top shows 75 million total. Then we identified improvements where disadvantaged communities exist, and those amounted to about $13.8 million, but they're not attributable, all attributable to disadvantage. Of the $13.8 million, attributed to disadvantaged communities is the $7.3 million. So that's another exercise that we completed um, for this project. And with that, I think that concludes the presentation. I kept it short. I can, if you'd like, I can talk for the next two hours. I'm here to talk about this, uh, but uh, I'm, 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 thank you for, the, for your time and patience, and I'm here to answer your questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Echo. That that was that was great. And I've I've looked over the plan, and it's really just a cornucopia of, of information that will take us all a long time to um, absorb. I I want to point out that um, we will be having another meeting on November tenth, where this is a special meeting that we've convened um, to present this to the public, which. Am, am I correct in saying that this will be a, a, an extended version of this, or will it be similar? It will be similar, but I can I can uh, focus where you'd like me to focus. If you'd like me to say uh, to to spend more time in certain elements as opposed to the the big picture, this is this is the uh, encompassing big picture. What is it? How do we use it? Uh, what are the elements that are in this master plan? If there's something else you'd like me to talk about, uh, I can I'm gladly here to talk about. Okay. Um, in light of the fact that we have another meeting um, on November 10th um, where we can provide more time for discussion, our goal tonight, I think, is to um, review the plan in order to decide whether to accept it. And hence, I would ask that board members and members of the public focus their comments and questions tonight um, on basically the technical adequacy of the plan um, and other technical questions that you might have. And that we defer a discussion of more wide ranging questions that are related to its implementation, um, which kind of involves issues of strategy and priorities and finances to the later meeting and also another one. Rick, did you have a comment? Yeah, I would just like to, to ask uh, board members if there are any areas that piqued an interest that you would like uh, Tony to expand for the, the presentation on the 10th to either speak up tonight or contact uh, Josh or I uh, in, in the next day or so, so we can make sure that's added to the presentation. Okay, that, that, that's a good point. Um, Mark, I'd like to start with you because you're the chair of the engineering uh, committee. If you have any comments. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the question uh, that I understand is in front of us is, is this plan uh, adequate? Are we okay with uh, approving this as is? Um, I have a few questions on it, uh, mostly from a regulatory perspective. Um, what is our regulatory deadline for submittal of this plan to the, uh, to the state? I don't believe there is. Tony? No, absolutely, there's no deadline. This is not, uh, I think if you might be referring to urban water management plan. Urban water management plan is a different document that is prepared every five years and it has a deadline. I think okay. uh, July 1st uh, of, uh, was of this last year uh, was the deadline for that. And But it's, it, it, okay. it, this is a water master plan that is mm -hmm. used to, um, uh, it's used to, uh, but for budgetary purposes, for management of the water system, um, and for planning of the water system, for enhancing the water system. The other document is regulatory, mandated by the states. You have to prepare right. them every five years. This is uh, a plan that you update when you feel there's a need to update it uh, for meeting your storage requirements, for meeting your criteria, um, and for okay. planning the, okay. the orderly so, re re renewal uh, and replacement. Following along that line, then, um, is there any uh, enforcement requirements then, and I'm guessing not from the state if they're not requiring us to submit this, enforcement requirements for us to uh, follow through on any of these items, particularly the priority one, any that are uh, fire safety related, or is it up to the district's discretion then on how we move through this, what we do without state input and oversight. Uh, Mark, this is a good question also. Again, this is up to, entirely up to the district to okay. chart your path, your okay. pace, your budget. It's your, you're spending the money, your budget. What, how, can, how much can you um, expend? Uh, how, how fast do you want? And you want to keep in mind one thing is that the, the, the further you, the, no action is taken, there'll be a mm -hmm. time when yeah. you cannot catch up anymore. Right. And, and that's why be... this is an orderly yeah. plan that gives you 
a, 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 a roadmap. That's a, right. you know, this is a right. little roadmap and you can choose to do whatever you like with that. Right. You can only drive your car so long without changing the oil. Absolutely. Before the engine's been up and you're not going to drive it. Right. Right. Um, the final question that I have then is related to uh, design criteria. Um, and it's related to the, uh, the 1.5 uh, times. Speaking factors, average yeah, day the, versus, yes. The maximum day demand. Um, and since we didn't, since we don't monitor on a daily basis our uh, demand usage and we do it on a monthly basis, we have to derive this. You ended right. up using a factor of 1.5 times the average day. Right. Um, how sensitive are all of these various improvements if that uh, factor was reduced? I'm looking at the total volume of dollars that you're recommending to spend, and does that change or help focus our priority levels? It will change because uh, this is a maximum day factor. We redesign right. pipelines not only for maximum day factors, we design pipelines for peak hour factors. Right. Uh, and, um, and the first thing you look at is what kind of information do we have? And we evaluate the trend and we could de derive mm -hmm. that information. Um, but the next step is we also look at state guidelines. The state gives you some guidelines. If you don't have information, they give right. you guidelines. You, you, they say you, it's okay for you to use those guidelines. So right. we, re we fall back and state, but we also use our uh, judgment in, in advising. You know, are these reasonable factors? Yes, they are reasonable factors for planning purposes and for, for the health of the system until we know better. Okay. Until we start monitoring on a daily basis and we get that information, then this is a, not a master plan forever. This is a master plan, you know, that we can, you know, for, for now we can, we can chart a path yeah. forward and it will be updated eventually, maybe in five years or whenever your district staff feel it's time to update because right. we would like to have different criteria. We have better information, okay. but for now, this is the better inform the best information we have. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Tony. That's, that's my questions at this point. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. Uh, Jamie, would you like to ask any questions? Sure. Um, thank you. So I, uh, first of all, I, I, I really appreciate the optimism and in, in your, you know, thought that, that at $75 million in today's it costs, that feels like getting ahead of the game. It feels like we're already so, so far behind the game um, when I look at this plan. But I, I really appreciate that this is about sort of getting our minds around what we need to do long term. So I'm, I'm taking a deep breath there. Um, I was uh, thinking about this in the context of other decisions that we are, are going to be asked to make, not just tonight, but in the um, coming weeks and months. Um, so when we look at this capital improvement program, I assume that it's contemplating everything that is within our assets right now and not anything that we would um, have to, uh, you know, factor in long term in terms of um, design and maintenance should we uh, merge with another water company that's within our geographic sphere of influence? Is that a safe assumption? Yes, Jamie, that is correct. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, so uh, so then I guess the, the, the question becomes like, how do we, if this is a living document, how do we continue to sort of reflect those changes as we make de you know, decisions as a body um, about you know how we are going to go forward. That would be where our dynamic model comes into play, the model that Tony was discussing. As we make changes or as we contemplate changes, we run those through the through the model, which is based on our static GIS model that we keep internally at the district. And as those changes are actually made, we update our static GIS to reflect the work that's been done and internally track what has changed in the master plan and either no longer needs to be addressed because it has been or needs to be addressed in a different way. 
Is there an opportunity um, using this modeling and um, you know these tools to get some like you know synergies here where we might um, see opportunities to complete projects in ways that we might not have um, ha we might not have like planned them together and grouped them together in that fashion to save money? Are, are, you know, are, are those opportunities with this kind of modeling tool? Yes, we've actually already used it that way in looking at the very first project that we had Tony model, which is our Lion pipeline, the new pipeline down 236 from just below our treatment plant into town and down to the firehouse, essentially. We have used the model to look at changes we could make in determining which areas are on which pressure zones, allowing us to look at possibly eliminating a couple of booster pumps, thus eliminating the need to maintain and provide power to those pumps, reducing operating costs. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all my questions for now. Thank you, Jamie. Bob? I had one clarification question and then uh, several comments. Uh, the clarification question then is, it sounds like, uh, Gail, you're, you're uh, advocating for a slightly different motion than, than what is recommended in the agenda. That is correct. I, I, I think that the, the and direct the district manager to implement the recommendations therein is a little bit too grand at this point um, and too vague. And so I, I personally, I would um, have a motion that if you will indulge me, says that move that the board accept the master plan and capital improvement plan as prepared by ACL engineering, period. Thank you for that clarification because, um, yes, this actually for, for me personally becomes um, a very important input point to a very wide-ranging discussion about finances. Uh, as you know, I have a finance bent as well um, regarding operating expenses, what our operating and non-operating margins are, how much money is available, what we can finance, what our debt ratios need to be, all those sorts of things as Mr. Akel is um, smiling since I'm sure he's heard all this before from many, many people. Um, so yes, I'm glad we're limiting it tonight. Um, well, I, 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 that's my suggestion, but that, you know. Well, that, 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 I, I, I think your suggestion is, is a really good one. So you're not gonna get an argument from me. Okay. Um, I, I do wanna say um, that on a personal note, this is something that is that I just find incredibly exciting. Um, I've been looking for this kind of information for almost a decade relative to my involvement in the, in the water district. And to see this come to fruition, to see the uh, SLVWT team work in this so diligently over the last couple of years and to get it to where we have a really nice model is just so exciting. It's, it, I can hardly stand myself at this point. Um, and what is really neat is that a lot of the numbers that Mr. Aiko came up with sort of match some of the back of the envelope numbers that I've been putting together as well, sort of independently. So I, I like to see that I'm not completely crazy about things. That's good too. Um, I do have a number of very specific requests, Rick, which I'll, I'll send you separately for the next meeting. Um, and uh, I, at that next meeting, I'm hopeful that we will begin that wide-ranging conversation about uh, not only the model, but how all of this fits into the, uh, uh, the financing of it, which to me, a plan really is not a plan if there's not a way to execute. Um, and execution in this place means money and how that money is, um, is raised. There's a number of options to do that. Um, but ultimately, all of the money uh, comes from the pockets of our community. And so understanding how to do that as efficiently and as at low cost as possible um, is, is really, I think, a key thing. So again, Mr. Akel, thank you for your presentation. Very, very exciting stuff. Rick, thank you to you and your team for working on this through the pandemic. I know it had to be challenging, but this is a defining moment for our district relative to how we manage going forward. And uh, I, I think we'll all remember this day for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Lois?
Lois, you're muted. All of my questions have to do with money. And I, I look at the projected numbers and I have watched over the last few years how things have are costing more and more and more. And I, I'm trying to think, we, we have another budget to do, trying to figure out how we can work this all into a budget. Um, it, it's, it's incredible information, but one of the things it doesn't really tell me is, it, well, it does say it's going to be X amount of dollars, maybe five years from now, maybe X amount of years from now. But I've worked with money long enough to know that it changes rapidly. And it, it's, this is exciting stuff, as Bob said. However, where's the money coming from? Because we have a lot of other things to spend money on besides capital improvement. And it would be great if we could spend all our money on capital improvement, but we can't. So I, I just uh, wonder if there's, if uh, he has a suggestion of how we figure out where this money's coming from and how far into the future can we look? I don't think we can look five years into the future. I think things are gonna change more rapidly than that. That's my questions. Would you like to respond to that, Mr. Eagle? Uh, I mean, absolutely. I can I can share what 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 I know from uh, from other places. We this is what we do. Our our firm is a special has a specialty in in master planning. We don't get into the finance aspect. A lot of times, we have on our team uh, financial experts that look into the next step. That is the next step. But when you have a when you hire a financial consultant to advise you on how to finance this improvement, they want something defensible to stand on. This is it. What you are looking at today is this defensible tool that they can that they can put there. That, that's that's is as solid has as solid as you can get in terms of defensibility, uh, because they want to make sure it's defensible, and they then they will come up with your options, your alternatives. Um, they will compare, you know, rates. You can, you can look at grants. You can look at rates compared to to others in in the area. But that's the next logical step is looking at finance. So I think you are, you know, Madam Vice President, Vice President, I think you are right on. This is the next step that is not included in this, in this master plan. This master plan is giving you a roadmap. It's telling you what needs to be done, how much is the estimated cost, and that's where it stops. And, 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 and typically would tell you this is attributed to existing users versus, you know, future users. In your case, they're mostly existing. It's an existing system, so it, the burden is is you know, on on the users that are using the current system. It is undersized. Uh, it identified and prioritized. It doesn't have to all to be done today. This is a plan that you can take it as far as you want. You can look at the ten-year plan and say for the next ten years, how much do we want to spend? How much can we afford to spend? But this is the expertise of a financial consultant that will come in. I'm sure Rick and Josh will bring someone on the team to take a look at the next step. Uh, this is providing you with the support that they need to look at to help to, to advise you on what's the next step. Okay, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, we do need someone with a financial background to look at what you've given us and tell us how we're going to get there. I'm not sure we can do that by ourselves. Okay, um, I'd like to go out now to members of the public. Um, and let's see if, um, wow, we have 42 members of the public here. That's great. Um, do any of them want to address this question? If you do, please raise your hand. 
No, okay, seeing none, hearing none. Um, if you don't, I'll come back to the board and- A hand uh, popped up. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, Jim, Jim Mosher, please go ahead. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank the board for all its hard work. I want to um, echo what Larry Ford said at the beginning of the meeting. My question about this is I'm wondering if the model allows for estimating potential savings based on conservation. In other words, if the if we were to have the heavy users in the district use substantially less water, more along the mean uh, of the of water use among uh, most users, <clears throat> would the model allow us to estimate how much would be saved? I'd imagine it could be in storage primarily, but I'm just wondering if that's something the model would uh, be capable of doing. Thank you. Uh, and that's also a, a great question. Uh, water conservation. I think water conservation has been taking effect, has been uh, in progress, as you can, as I think, as I, I mentioned, um, your, your water was at one point uh, on an annual basis at uh, two, um, and then it, it has been um, it has been going down. So you have been seeing the effect of water conservation. Uh, and we have used the trends. So we, and we did not overestimate. We used actual where we are today. So we have to use the existing uh, use. We want to we want to make sure we can meet the the current characteristics of what, how customers are using water today. Planning for the future, yes. If we see a trend, say in five years, we see the water has been you know been reduced further. Your, your residents are conserving more, and the state wants you to do that. I think I mentioned the urban water management plan. The state will continue to squeeze down, whether indoors or outdoors. They want us to use less and conserve more. And if that happens to be the case, and in five years you revisit this plan and find out that yes, indeed, water is being used less, I think you'll find that some of the storage tank, as an example, will be reduced uh, in size, uh, maybe, but not by much. But there'll be some cost saving, absolutely, and every 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 bit helps. Um, on the pipeline, some might be reduced, but when you look at fire flow, fire flows will not, there's no water conservation in fire flows. Uh, if we need to meet that fire, we need to have that amount available. And we are, we are our system is way undersized in this case here to meet fire flows. Um, so there, there's a big need to enhance it. And it, again, when you look at big numbers like this, it's very understandable uh, to, to not, not expect it to be done all overnight. But we we don't want to underreport. It's better. Our job is to provide the technical answer. The next step is looking at priorities. We cannot fix it all. And what can we do with the limited funds that we have? And and maybe we can come up with uh, the, maybe the financial consultant can come up with with ideas to finance it in different ways, smarter ways. Uh, but and 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 like everybody else, the system. A is aging. Our infrastructure is aging. It's not our fault that it's it's aging. It needs to be, you know, fixed. At one point, it needs to be replaced. So as it ages, maybe you, maybe the pipelines are going to age anyways. So instead of replacing that four inch with a four inch, we need to replace it with an eight inch, and make sure that it's it has the capacity. Pay a little bit more, but the pipeline might be reaching the end of its life cycle anyways. And we'll take that opportunity. So it's not all, let's all fix it right now. The pipelines are going to age and they will need to be replaced eventually. And when that time comes, we want to make sure we replace them with the proper size. Okay. Uh, Bob? Uh, were you calling on me, Gail? Yes, I, I was. Were, oh, I'm sorry. There were a number of, ten, uh, number of community members that are oh. raising their hand. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's one more. I didn't see that. Um, Nicole? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Nicole. Okay. Hi. Um, good evening. Um, a couple questions. One, is this master plan um, available um, on the website for the public to view? It is, Nicole. Okay. It is found on the engineering page on the district's website. Okay, great. And then um, I'm just curious, just based off of listening to the news today, um, um, it's hard to, 
I, I appreciate you keeping the presentation short. It was very um, interesting and leads you want to read more. Um, it speaks about the diameter of the pipe. So I'm curious whether um, in your process, did you identify any pipes that needed to be um, dealt with because of the type of material, where there might be lead or anything like that? Is there um, that type of identification in this report as well? I'm sorry, was it based on type of, was that the material is adequate or not? No, no, whether it um, poses a health risk. In other words, if she's worried about lead in pipes. Ah, so so I think you're, you're, you're the question is probably uh, geared towards your know, connection, ladder connections that uh, go to from the pipeline in the street to to a residence. Um, we looked at pipelines that are in the streets, uh, okay. the ones that are being used to convey water from the source to the tank and uh, to the streets in front of residences. I think uh, we did not look at pipelines that go from the street to the house and what material they are and. And, and all that, that's a different world that we, we did not look at into that. Okay, then one last question. You had indicated that um, four inch and six inch are not sufficient for fire flow. Um, if you are in a dead end area, smaller uh, part of neighborhood is six inch sufficient as long as you're getting enough pressure? Right, so when you come up with a with a, the cul-de-sac, there's it, it is common, we see that come as common practice to give a 50% credit, I've seen that. And I've seen that in places where they say, no, no credit. But in, it's a it's cul-de-sac, you say, okay, we're gonna give a 50% credit and it's okay to allow the fire flow not to be a thousand uh, gallons per minute, but maybe 500 gallons per minute is sufficient for a cul-de-sac. Um, so it, it all depends on, on what the criteria is. I've seen it both ways. Okay. I mean, of course we all want but, to have- And the adequate. six inch, yeah. Right, and six, I've seen six inches a lot, cul-de-sac, that's what you see, but four inches, not recommended at all. Right, right, and after going through the fire, none of us want that. <laughs> yes, that's, it's that's a all. risk, again, it's a risk. It's how much we want to buy in terms of insurance to make sure it doesn't happen during the fire season, we all want to get that risk. And, and nowadays, we probably can scale back and relax a little bit, um, but it's, it's uh, your staff worry about this, your engineering staff worry, they want to make sure that the system is property size, can defend when we need it to defend, can provide the capacity when we need to provide the capacity, has enough reliability when, when we need it. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the public? If not, um, go ahead, Bob. Well, I, I just wanted to say in, in regards to an earlier question, I, unfortunately, I'm not sure we're going to see significant savings uh, in capital infrastructure based on conservation alone um, because of the fire flow and storage requirements to support fire flow for the time period that is required to meet sort of uh, best practices, um, unfortunately. Uh, so really what we're looking at here is um, being able to figure out how to do things as efficiently and economically as possible. And I think that we as a board do have some tools available to us to set policies around supporting how to do that. Um, yes, there are financial experts available to us that we've used in the past for the financing. There's bond issue uh, options, there's um, grant options, that sort of thing. We have now a grant uh, writer. So I think we're using those levers and we've established policies that are gonna take us down that path. But ultimately at the end of the day, the board is the one that's gonna determine um, increases in operating expenses and non-operating expenses, which determines our margin. Our rates are gonna determine our margin. Those are all decisions that we make um, and that I think we need to have a robust conversation about at a future time. Um, and I'm looking forward to having that and, and uh, having that conversation with you, Lois. I think that'd be a really good thing for us to do. Are there any more questions or comments from the board addressing the technical aspects of the report? If not, um, I would like to just repeat um, my revision of the staff recommendation, which is uh, that we move that the board accept the master plan and capital improvement plan as prepared by ECHL Engineering. Second that. Okay. Um, any questions or comments about that motion? All right, 
If not, um, Holly, you want to take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood? Aye. President Henry? Lois, are you muted? No, muted. Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. And Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes that we accept uh, the report. And thank you, uh, Mr. Echo, for coming and, and speaking to us and answering our questions um, My pleasure. so generously you. and nicely. We appreciate it. Fantastic. Okay. Um, next, we move to our second uh, item of old business, remote meeting authorization under AB 361. I think district council will present that to the board. Okay. Thank you, uh, District Manager Rogers, Chair Mayhood. Um, I'll keep this brief, given that this item has been before the board a few times in the past couple of months. Um, two, uh, approximately a month ago, the board did adopt resolution number 421-22, which is in your packet, which approves uh, the district to continue conducting remote uh, meetings of the type that we're conducting right now under AB 361. Uh, in order to continue to conduct remote meetings under that law and this resolution, the board every 30 days has to make certain findings that are set forth in that motion. Um, in short, the key findings are uh, that the statewide declaration of emergency continues in effect, which it does, and that state and local health officials continue to recommend social distancing measures, uh, which they do. In particular, county public health recommends the use of face covering indoors and moving activities and meetings outdoors to the greatest extent possible. Um, and on that basis, uh, the proposed action for the board is to uh, uh, readopt and uh, ratify the uh, existing resolution uh, number 421-22. Okay, so the uh, motion that the staff are, has put before us is that the board ratifies and readopts the attached resolution number four so that it continues in effect for another 30 days from today's date. And I'll go ahead and move that. Or is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, any discussion? Um, and I guess I probably should go out to members of the public to see if they have any comments on this. You do raise your hand. If not, um, oh, sorry, Mark Lee. I'm sorry, I lowered my hand. Okay, it's all right. Uh, okay, then uh, it's been moved and seconded. Um, any more discussion by members of the board? If not, um, can we take a vote, Holly? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. And Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the resolution passes. Um, next, we move to our first um, item of new business, which is possible consolidation with Big Basin Water Company. Um, Rick, you want to begin a presentation on that? Yes, thank you, Chair Mayhood. On October 26, uh, 2021, owners of the Big Basin Water Company requested uh, that the San Lorenzo Valley Water District explore possible consolidation uh, with the company. Uh, the district has provided some emergency assistance on a limited basis to the company and to its uh, customers since the CZU wildfire seriously damaged the company's water system. Uh, most recently on October 20th, the district dispatched a repair crew to facilitate repairs uh, in the Big Basin water system after a mainline break uh, caused a, uh, a system outage. The district prides itself on providing reliable, safe, and high quality water to its customers at an equitable price and its history of extending service to neighbors and consolidating with smaller system. Uh, the district appreciates the interest expressed by uh, Big Basin and a possible water system consolidation and the willingness of the County of Santa Cruz to consider taking over the responsibility of the 
of the company's wastewater system, which the district is not in a position to operate. I'm asking uh, the board tonight to uh, adopt uh, um, by motion to direct the district manager to proceed with exploring possible water system consolidation with Big Basin Water Company, including uh, authorizing to incur legal and grant writing expenses within the amount of the district manager's uh, purchasing authority. And for clarification, this uh, proposed motion would not authorize additional expense for consulting work such as engineering studies or reports that would be needed for a water system consolidation or annexation into the district. Um, it is anticipated that the district and the Big Basin Water Company will enter into written agreements along the following lines uh, 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 before additional district expense are authorized. And I, we have three areas that we would uh, legal counsel uh, and the district would like to move forward with. And that's the company should enter into an emergency operating agreement with the district that governs the party's relationships while exploring consolidation uh, and any requests for emergency assistance by the company. Uh, the company should agree to cover costs incurred by the district less than the amount of grant funding obtained by the district to help cover such costs with a, a view towards minimizing costs absorbed by the district during the consolidation process and any cost imposed on Big Basin residents, including any assessments of water surcharge imposed uh, as part of the consolidation. And the company should agree to include the district in any negotiations involving the proposed sale of any company assets and to cooperate in good faith with the district to uh, ensure that any such sale includes appropriate protections for the integrity of the water system, including without limitations, easements, including easements uh, in the company's watershed to protect uh, the water quality, water rights, and access to facilities. Um, since discussion with Mr. Moore and even before, there has been a great deal of support with county and state elected officials I received many emails and phone calls from supports uh, from the uh, residents and customers of Big Basin Water. As you know, we are working with Bracken Bray and Forest Springs on consolidating as well um, as they are now customers of Big Basin Water. Um, I am asking the board uh, to consider uh, these recommendations and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, before we go out to members of the board, um, I, I'd just like to say that Bruce McPherson, our representative on the Board of Supervisors, has asked to address the board about the county's support of a potential consolidation. And I thought it would probably be good for him to do that now mm -hmm. because maybe some of the board questions would also be directed at him um, as well as um, at the members of our staff. So, um, Bruce, would you like to address us now? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, good evening. And thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. Uh, very interesting presentation, uh, straightforward on the master plan. Um, but on Big Basin, I, I want to thank the district board and uh, especially just manager Rick Rogers for agendizing this item of tonight's meeting. I, I do know that I speak for many Big Basin water customers when I say we appreciate your consideration of exploring this further. Uh, it demonstrates really the district's uh, commitment to the community and being a critical partner in the Valley for all of our residents in Santa Rosa Valley. And I was there when they were, they were uh, taking water from the tap uh, right there and talked to some of those members. They're surely appreciative of everything that you're doing for them in these, this crisis situation. As we know for many months, uh, and maybe you do not know, my, my office has been in close contact with your district, the State Water Resources Control Board and our state elected uh, representatives to work out a possible solution for the Big Basin customers, about 500 of them. Um, I wanna thank them, most especially Rick Rogers for their many efforts to date. Um, it's, it's taken longer than I think we, we all would have hoped for. I think we hope we can come to a conclusion very soon. Um, but if you choose to take uh, the next step tonight, um, I can assure you that the county stands ready to provide resources through my staff and our county resource, water resource division and the staff of our Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience 
to work alongside with you on this um, idea of a consolidation. Uh, we know this process, if you move forward, will eventually include exploring grant operations at the state and federal level and navigating different regulatory agencies, uh, some of which um, will, be com this will be complex at, at times. But I, I believe that in the investment of the time and energy to date and moving forward will benefit all of us, not just the water supply and reliability for a big base of customers, but also for the sustainability of the, the valley overall. Um, so I just wanna thank you and especially your district manager, Rick Rogers again for having uh, the discussion tonight. And I, I look forward to uh, you working uh, with the district on this, um, should you go forward tonight on identifying what uh, cons uh, consolidation process that you might, uh, what it might look like. Uh, I think that uh, Rick Rogers has outlined that process or what the needs are of his recommended actions. Uh, I support them wholly. And um, I sure hope this comes to fruition in the very near future for the people of Big Basin and for the San Lorenzo Valley in general. Okay. Thank you very much, Supervisor McPherson. Um, let's go ahead and ask, uh, have members of the board ask any questions of staff or of Supervisor McPherson. Jamie, can I start with you, please? Sure, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so first of all, I, I, I wanna start by saying that, you know, I think um, generally when the subject of Big Basin has come up in these meetings over the several months, um, you know, what I have always heard from our fellow board members is, that we take our responsibility as a member of the community and, and therefore supporting all of our community members, not just San Lorenzo Valley Water District customers in the recovery effort here in the, in the valley. So um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, I think, uh, you know, it is important that all of our community have a way to continue to have a you know, safe, healthy, reliable water supply, um, because that is so critical to your basic quality of life. So, um, you know, that said, I, I, you know, just want to sort of think about um, as we are, are, you know, going forward in this process, um, you know, one of the things I know in, in my past when I was with uh, working in, in the water industry um, in Silicon Valley, and we looked at the potential for taking on water acquisitions. Um, it was it was really important to us, uh, particularly because we were a, a CPUC uh, regulated utility, that we um, not be requiring that our existing rate payers incur uh, the costs associated with upgrading the new system we were taking on. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess my question would be. Um, as, as we start having these conversations, is there a point where uh, the California Department of Water Resources gets involved? Because I know that there are sort of some, some very prescriptive requirements that they've set out for Big Basin. And, you know, how do we navigate those in a way that, um, you know, successfully, you know, gets us to a conclusion without impacting our existing ratepayers? That's my first question. And my second question is, is it possible because of the number of, of uh, customers and connections that we're talking about that we would not have the, um, infra the, the requirement to rebuild as much infrastructure to serve these customers as Big Basin would have to rebuild um, in order to continue to in uh, operate independently? And I, I get that that's a lot, of, um, a lot to ask. We may not have that information, but those are my questions. You know, I, I, I can take a, a stab at answering your questions, Jamie. They're both great. This process is intended to, uh, and as a motion tonight, is, is intended to find funding outside of the district, such as in grants and, and other agencies. And some funding may have to be bared by the customers of Big Basin. Uh, we are not looking for the district customers to provide funding for uh, the improvements and repairs. Um, Again, there is a lot of money. I've been receiving a lot of support from our county and state elected officials. There is a lot of grant money available right now for a drought response, for um, consolidation of a smaller agency into a larger agency. And once, if the board approves this motion tonight moving forward, that'll be our next step working with our county and state elected officials on facilitating and locating grants to apply for. 
Um, but there is some legal work that needs to be done first, and that's what we're asking tonight. On your second question, uh, I have spoken to the State Water Resources Control Board, and most likely all of the requirements that Big Basin, all the requirements have been placed on Big Basin will be placed on whoever uh, takes over ownership of that agency. Um, and they're not going to back off on those. They, you know, their health and safety, water supply issues. Uh, Bob? Yeah, thank you, Annette. And um, though I think, Rick, uh, just to clarify on that, it's possible that we would not have to build another treatment plant, is right? I think that might have been what, what Jamie was, thank, was getting thank at. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there's a, you know, I, I don't know Big Basin Water, and our staff doesn't know Big Basin Water, obviously, as well as we know our own system. But we will, one of the first things that we will do, and we will find, we need to find some money. It takes money to, to apply for money. And hopefully, yes, we can do an engineering analysis where we could bring the surface water, uh, and I don't really want to get in the weeds, but bring their surface water over to our treatment plant, eliminating, you know, a very costly treatment plant and O&M, ongoing O&M. Okay. But that will be something that needs to be worked out. And those were the engineering studies come from and the types of things that we need money up front uh, or pledge money up front. Cause so, so we'll either reimburse the district or pay for up front because the district is not in a financial uh, place to, to be able to, um, to pay for those uh, services. Well, that, that was going to be one of my questions, but I think I knew what that answer was already. But I think it's important that people hear it. Um, I, I'd like to preface my, um, I think, last remaining question with some comments about this. You know, it, my personal policy as a board member is that we need to do everything we can to support our neighbors during times of crisis. And so um, I was very pleased that we were able to provide that water station and, and continue to do that uh, kind of support as needed during emergency situations. Um, it's also my personal policy as a board member that we um, respond to these kinds of requests, that is the requests that come into us, not that we're going out and seeking them, uh, in a way that um, is in line with our community's culture about how we wanna work together and support each other uh, in these kinds of things. So uh, from that point of view, um, I think this is a very good thing to do. Uh, that, that said, um, I've been in the Valley long enough and have gone through a couple of acquisitions before uh, Felton and Long Pico where we have learned things about the process of doing that and how things, um, you know, don't always necessarily work out the way that you want them to do financially and making sure that our existing rate payers are uh, not paying for the cost of this is very important. So I'm, Rick, I'm very glad to hear that you know, we are looking for funds outside of uh, the district to, to do that. I, I know that it is a state policy to, um, uh, you know, sort of consolidate as many small districts as, as possible. And, and I think there's still a question about what small means, um, but I think certainly 500 is, is in their range of where they want to see this consolidated. So hopefully that'll be reflected in the, in the great excuse me, grant money that, that comes forth. Um, so I, I think from this point of view, you know, a lot of things you've said already, uh, Rick, are, are really good and answer a lot of my questions. I did have one last question that at some point soon, um, we are going to be involved in a rate study. Um, and is it possible that um, the rate study would be able to include um, the possibility of the consolidation as part of looking at what costs really would be for um, Big Basin if they were to become part of our uh, district? You know, that, that's a great question. And, you know, when we put the RFP together and if the consolidation process is moving forward and the annexation process is moving forward, you know, I would recommend that to the Finance Committee on putting the RFP uh, together. And I think that uh, would be uh, a smart uh, addition to uh, our rate analysis. And we could probably single that out from the rest of our system. But yes, Bob. Okay. Well, one other thing I, I just remembered, and this is sort of inspired always by Jamie and her um, 
uh, emphasis on making sure that we are communicating and messaging well to the community, not only San Lorenzo Valley Water District community, but Big Basin community about this process as it's going forward. Um, I, I really would like to see us think about that. Perhaps that's an admin committee type uh, discussion, but I, I think the messaging around this is going to be so important um, because there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of concern on the part of people, uh, justifiably so, about where things are going, what the status is, all that sort of thing, and communication in that area, making sure that everybody can get to information as reliably and quickly as possible, I think is just going to be essential uh, as we move through this process. And I agree, not getting into the details, but the number one question I'm hearing from Big Basin customers is that they want to know what's going on. Yes. And we've already discussed, you know, putting a section on our website, if this moves forward, you know, start just like as we did with Lumpico, develop, you know, frequently asked questions, get some neighborhood meetings going. The only way this is going to move forward is with the support of Big Basin Water um, folks. And so you are 100% correct that that will be a number one priority to work with uh, uh, the Big Basin mm -hmm. customers with outreach. And, and then just to wrap this up, I do want to recognize and acknowledge um, the Moors for making this request. This is, you know, their their life um, uh, endeavor, something that they've worked on for a very, very long time. And so to come forward in this fashion, um, I think, you know, we need to acknowledge that. That took a lot. Um, and I want to thank you for making that outreach to us. And let's see if this is something that can be done. Strongly agree. You know, I've worked alongside Jim Moore probably for about 40 years. And, you know, it's unfortunate that a small agency like that can't keep up with the state regulations, can't keep up with PSPS power outages, COVID, fire, and drought. You know, the state is pushing the small agency out, out of business, so to speak. And um, he's, uh, I think he's done a pretty, incredible job over the years. Jamie, did you just have a follow-up on something Bob said? Yes, I, I, and I appreciate all of the kind words about the Moors. I was just it, thinking, as Bob was saying, that, that because they are, you know, a partner in this process, they will be one of our best assets to helping to reach their customers, and, and that is a concern. Um, that I have heard from some corners about, you know, making sure that all big basin customers or as many as possible are, are really deeply involved in the process and also um, on board with it because, uh, you know, there, there, there may be pockets of concern out there uh, that we need to address. Uh, as well, there will be. There definitely will be, you know, but that's okay. That's part of the process. Okay. Lois? Oh, I'd like to thank Supervisor McPherson for promising his help. Also, I know from my own experience that SLV helps their neighbor. They go out of their way to make things better for their neighbor. However, it's also up to the neighbor uh, to do their part. And I part of the problem that I'm aware of is when part of the community doesn't want to go forward with this, if they delay and delay things, prices continue to go up. So we really need to work on getting people in Big Basin to understand they need to put their support behind this. They it's going to cost them some money, I believe. Maybe I'm wrong. I, but it seems to me it's going to cost them some money. They need to know how much that's going to be. Uh, and the longer they wait, the more it's going to cost. And I know that um, our district manager uh, once he gets the go ahead with this and can work on it, it will go. It, he will move forward with it and and get this work done in a timely manner. That's all. Mark? 
Yes. Um, <clears throat> Rick, you alluded to uh, funds that either the state through DWR might have or that the county has in the form of grants. And I've heard it from you, but I'd like to hear from Supervisor McPherson uh, specifically since he is with the county and can comment on that. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, um, are you able to commit to bringing funds to this effort, particularly where Rick is addressing the need for upfront costs um, and to help from the county's perspective doing some of this initial funding uh, so that we can make that happen within the near term, say within the next 60 to 90 days to help uh, a lot of this initial work. I think you're muted, Bruce. Yeah, uh, because it is a private firm overseen by the state, uh, the, the funding is going to be have to be coming from state and federal sources. And I think Rick could speak more directly to that than we can. Um, we have numerous districts, uh, water, recreation, sanitation, and so forth throughout the county that are that are facing some tough times now. And so uh, we we can maybe address them, but in an independent agency such as this, right. we would look for state uh, and federal support. And okay. uh, the, um, But believe me, we, we have been in a lot of discussions already with the PUC, uh, the State Water Resources Control Board, and the state, uh, uh, Assemblyman Stone and Senator Laird. Uh, they are very well aware of the situation. And uh, that's where I think we're gonna get the help. Uh, and I think we might, I think we're in, uh, I don't want to over, I think we're in a uh, pretty good position to get some of that funding uh, in the short term too. I don't think we're going to have to be waiting for four or five years, but I'm probably uh, speaking beyond what I should be saying. Rick would probably have a better sense of that. Uh, but from the people I've talked to, uh, they know the crisis situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the funding, frankly, would be coming from as a state okay. grant. Okay. You, you've clarified for me then, not the county for funding, right? State because we, I, for okay. instance, we we have you know like FEMA. We're waiting. Uh, we're not sure we're going to get twelve million dollars. We thought was coming to us, and so we right. we're kind of yeah. waiting ourselves on some things too. Yes, and I understand that. Uh, I misunderstood Rick saying that possible grants from the county. So okay, you've addressed that question, um, Rick. Staying on the financial aspects. Uh, does Big Basin Water Company have any of the financial resources to support or engage in any of these upfront costs that you're aware of? In particular, uh, doing some of the initial engineering feasibility aspects to determine what is this overall bill going to be? Great question. We're not there yet until, and that's what these agreements, and once the board authorizes, we will sit down um, okay. with Big Basin. They have provided a lot of their uh, ownership and corporation documents uh, to council um, for review. So once the board approves moving forward, then we roll up our sleeves and, and start discussion um, with the owners of Big Basin. Okay. Okay. Um, outside of the financial, then I have a, a, a question or two on their regulatory um, aspects. Uh, the 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 lack of response uh, from what I've seen in the packet um, from Big Basin Water to the state um, from their April 2021 citation, and then the follow-up that I see from the state uh, with another citation in September is concerning to me. Um, if we're getting involved in this process, uh, are we then uh, becoming implicated in that, are we uh, then becoming responsible to DWR as part of that citation aspect until we, and until we take it over, who is doing that? I've approached that subject just recently with the State Water Resource Control Board, um, uh, Monterey, mm -hmm. um, who issued the citation. And one of the, once they knew that the board was moving in consolidation and annexation, 
we would sit down and put together a scope of work and a schedule to make those improvements if the annexation goes through. And they've indicated to me that they would dial back on any of the uh, citations. Okay. Um, if the district was moving towards ownership and if the district put together a plan uh, for improvements. Now, they're not gonna back off on, they, they made it clear to me that on water quantity and water quality. Uh, there's a lot of things they will back off, but they're concerned about the available water supply for Big Basin, and they're available, and there's concern about quality, which is totally understanding. And we can work on that. I mean, we can work on an emergency inner tie. We can do a few things, but I got to get upfront money. You know, we're going to need some money for preliminary engineering. And this is where we're going to have to go out to uh, our state legislators, to the State Water Resource Control Board. I don't even care. We have to go to the governor for an emergency grant. The governor gave a Lumpico an emergency grant for the inner tie. No questions asked um, that uh, Lois and her board apply for. So we're not going to take no for an answer. We got to get t-shirts made up with a slogan. Don't take no for an answer. We'll do it. Okay. We need money. And uh, I can't emphasize that enough. And all of the people, all of our uh, uh, politicians and our local uh, leaders who, who stepped up and, and pushed for consolidation, we got it now. Um, now we need your help. Um, LAFCO has stepped up. Uh, Joe Sherano has been a great help. We'll do whatever he can to help the annexation process. The outpour from local leaders have been really extraordinary. I mean, uh, it's been, you know, no questions asked. What do you need? We'll help you. You know, Bruce's office, uh, uh, this, uh, the new county uh, water uh, resource, uh, Sierra Ryan, has sent us a list of grants and definitions of which grants to apply for for which. I mean, folks are on board and already trying to uh, help facilitate this. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I guess that leaves me. Um, I uh, am in favor of the motion that's in front of us that the staff has recommended and I will be voting positively on it. Um, I, I feel comfortable doing that because of the clarifications that also follow, which I feel um, protect the district financially. I mean, we're, we're following the CCU fire. We have our own financial problems. We're in not as good a shape as we were, for example, before Lompico or the Felton acquisitions where, you know, we, we could afford some of these things. So I, I feel that the, um, the, way we've uh, authorized certain kinds of expenses um, to get the process started is correct and that we'll have to come back for other funding um, that hopefully will be paid for out of grants. But I think this makes me feel that also it, it, it protects us because this is a process where, as we saw, the current owners have not been responsive to the state. Um, and so that may produce difficulties. And of course we have to, as Lois said, um, make sure that a majority of the people uh, of Big Basin are on board this. And so there, there needs to be a little bit of protection um, for us, but I, I feel like um, this memo provides that. And so I'll be voting yes. Um, is there any more comments by the board before I go out to the public? Chair Mayhood, before you go to the public, can, there seems to be a, you know, there's a large group of folks from Big Basin that may want to address the board. We may want to limit public comment to two minutes. Okay. Your, um, your call. I mean, I think there's quite a few people. Yeah. On well, we don't, we don't know how many people want to speak, but I, but I think, yeah, let's limit it to, um, because there, we have 43 people in attendance, let's limit the individual comments to two minutes. Um, we do have a timer that will appear on the screen so you can track yourself. And I'd also ask um, that you not repeat things that previous speakers have said. If you want to just pop up and say, yeah, I agree with that, and then stop, that would be great. Um, but we, I mean, because we want to hear from you all, but let, let's try to keep the repetition to a, a minimum. Okay, so um, I see Mark Lee has his hand up, so go ahead. 
Yes, thank you, President Mahood, and thank you to the board. I think the proposal by Rick Rogers is uh, an excellent motion, and I think we should proceed forward with a vote of approval. Thank you. Thank you. That was short and sweet. Yay. Um, <laughs> Jeff Hill. It might be helpful if people identify uh, what normally you give your name and where you live. So it'd be good to know if people are from Big Basin or if they're other, you know, what, what their affiliation is, just so we have some context, if you don't mind. Okay, so I'm Jeff Hill, uh, live in Scotts Valley. Uh, I'm also on the district's uh, budget and finance committee. Uh, earlier this evening, we heard a really good presentation about the um, engineering uh, operational model that was used to build the plant, the master plan. And it occurs to me that uh, we might want to take a quick look at how hard it would be to uh, plug the big basin system into that plan and see how well that plan integrates. Yes, I think, and, and also uh, Forest Hills and Brackenbrae as, as well. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a, yeah. there's a good model there and unless it's you know really expensive, we probably ought to, take advantage of that model and, and uh, plug those systems into the model and see what it does to the rest of the system. So I, I, Mark, would it be fair to say that the engineering committee could take that up? Yes, I think we can discuss that at a, the next engineering committee meeting. Okay. And, and modeling is already included in the cost to um, consolidate Bracken Bray and Forest Springs. Uh, we're still waiting to hear on that grant. But that was part of that engineering uh, is to model that system. Yay, good. Thank you. Um, Nancy Macy. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. I'm speaking for the myself, Nancy Macy, a resident of Boulder Creek, not in Big Basin Water District. And I am speaking for the Valley River Club's Environmental Committee. Bravo. Hooray, we have received so many comments and urgent questions and, and uh, people reaching out from Big Basin Water um, who are so concerned with, with what's going on and the lack of reliability and all the issues that, that they're facing. And um, they have repeatedly said they are grateful for SLV Water for all the emergency help, which went beyond just applying, uh, you know, providing water. It, it included actually going and digging in the dirt for, you know, with just within the past month. So many thanks. And um, uh, I, I admire Rick for the very careful phrasing and thoughtful uh, uh, recommendation that he's come up with and we strongly support it. Thank you for the opportunity. Good luck. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Julie Jennings. Um, so, go ahead, Julie. Okay, now can you hear me? All right. Yes, we can. Um, sorry. Um, I am a big basin water um, but, uh, user, I guess. And um, one thing I heard, and that was a little concerning, um, was that. I, I heard annexation, and I don't quite know if that means we're being brought into San, Len, San Lorenzo Valley Water uh, District. Also, um, if we were, I also heard uh, some of the directors saying that they didn't want to take money that they currently have for the, uh, their district and use it on the Big Basin Water uh, customers, which I understand and compassionate on that. Um, and if that's the case, then I hope then if we were annexed or brought in that the big basin water customers would not be paying that very large capitalization that, um, you're currently looking at. So, um, you know, it, I guess it goes both ways. Right. Um, so that would be my only concern on that. Um, if that wasn't the case, if they're going to come and help build this back up, then you have 500 more people that are helping to pay for that. So I just think it needs to be fair either way. So that's all I have to say. Okay. 
Thank you for that input, Julie. Um, let's see, we have Mike. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Mike. Mike's muted still. Mike, uh, can you talk to us? Otherwise, we'll... Yeah, here I, here I am. Great. Okay, so um, we lost our house in the August 2020 wildfire, and we're going through the long, hard process of uh, going to rebuild. But yeah, it's been very scary to build a massive investment uh, with uh, water systems that aren't, aren't assured. Um, in going through the rebuild process, one of the things... I want to make sure is that we don't get hit doubly. In other words, right now, rebuild is requiring 10,000 gallons of storage, which makes up for the lack of infrastructure from the water company. I just don't want to get hit with both expenses of, you know, buying into the water agency and putting 10,000 gallons storage. Anyway, something to think about. And, uh, I, for one, would be interested in working on um, any citizen committees uh, a part of, uh, you know, Big Basin uh, annexation and so forth. I, I work for a big water agency over the, over the hill uh, in a daily life and have some good water experience. So thank you. Well, you make a good point there, Mike, about that potential issue, which I hadn't thought about. Um, and please go ahead and send a, an email to uh, Rick Rogers uh, volunteering your, your time, because I imagine at some point, if this goes through, we probably will have uh, some ways in which we want to reach out to people in uh, Big Basin. Right, and Thank we can reach out to the county, Dave Reed, and, and talk about folks that are rebuilding and, and, and that, that issue he brought up about fire flow. Um, it may be complicated, but we should be able to work something out with the county. Okay. Ann, Ann Thrift? Sorry. Um, yeah, hi, this is Ann Thrift. I do live in the Big Basin Water area. Um, I've been relatively vocal publicly and not so publicly about the problems here. They're, they're pretty extreme. At this point, as far as I can tell, uh, consolidation with San Lorenzo Valley Water is the only option left for this company, except for state takeover. And my understanding is that that's not likely to happen, that the state doesn't really want to do that. But we are in an emergency situation, and it's been going on for a year, and it's been getting worse in the last few weeks. So I really, really hope that you guys decide to to move forward. I would be happy to be on a citizens committee to help help in any way to make this possible. I don't know um, what I could do, but I'm happy to help if, if that's something that's useful. And I wanted to say again, thank you guys so much for all the help that you have given us after the fire, especially with that water station. So thank you. You're welcome, Anne. Uh, Carl DeSoto. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Carl. Hi, I'm Carl's wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we, um, one of the issues, we do live in uh, Big Basin Water Territory for customers. And I guess um, our really big concern from the very beginning, we've been here six years, is, is just the lack of basic communication. Um, we often only find out that we can't drink the water and we have to boil it. Um, via email, I mean, not email, excuse me, via Nextdoor or Facebook groups. Um, there's no telephone calls to us. There's no emails sent out. There's no way of contacting the customers. So um, we're just wondering, first of all, we're totally in support of the whole idea of consolidation. And it is a very dire situation here. Um, 
we never know if the water is going to be off or on at any moment. Uh, you can walk up to your faucet and it just nothing comes out. And the only way you can find out why is, is again, to, to go to social media. So during the consolidation, we're wondering if this happens, how will we be communicated with? Will you guys be able to communicate with us about outages and those sorts of things? And, a, and a, do you guys have a system that uh, allows us to find out right away what's going on? Rick, can you answer that? Quickly? I'll, I'll try to answer that. And because until we move to the next step and sit down and work with uh, the Moors to find out the level of involvement that they would like to see the district with right away during the consolidation process. If they would like to see us, you know, work with them on notifications and so forth, you know, we would step up. But until we have those discussions, you know, with the, the owners of Big Basin Water, I can't answer that. But we would, you know, we, we do update social media. We do update website. Uh, we do have a, a reverse calling page temper tech system that we can let uh, folks know. But once once we learn the the extent that uh, Big Basin Water wants the district to uh, to work with them, then we can you know take that next step. But we would be willing to uh, work with Big Basin and to facilitate that if need be. But that that's where these these first agreements will come, and when we sit down uh, with the Moors and uh, move this forward, and we'll also have to work with uh, State Water Resource Control Board. So there'll be a little, you know, what I guess I would call startup. Uh, and to the same folks that said those questions at Big Basin that want to be involved, um, both when we did Lumpico and we did Felton consolidations, we had steering committees uh, uh, um, made up of individuals that live in the area that met regularly with district staff and the movers and shakers, um, which worked very well to keep uh, good communications and input. Thank you. Okay. Thank uh, you. Dan Hughes. Dan, are you there? Yeah, sorry. I just had to unmute. Okay. Um, everything I've heard um, from the uh, golf course area. And um, everything I've heard about the merger so far is very encouraging. Um, there's been uh, multiple articles and different publications regarding uh, uh, concerns in, in the state of the Big Basin Water um, in the last year. And the one uh, recently by Hannah that was put in the uh, Santa Cruz Sentinel on, on uh, yesterday, I think, uh, pretty much hit the nail on the head with uh, issues and concerns. Um, it was mentioned um, in this meeting that um, that um, San Lorenzo Valley water would, would need um, the uh, customer constituent, um, big basin support, uh, customer support for this merger. And I'm wondering how that can be conveyed. Um, you know, there's there's probably old timers in in this district that uh, um, are pretty staunch supporters of the Moors on a personal level and um, may not support merging with a you know a bigger company, uh, regardless of the circumstances. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would like to uh, if you guys could speak on how we could convey um support for this merger just uh real quick dan and, you know in speaking with the moors and i speak quite frequently with jim moore he is highly supporting this merger and will be out supporting this with his customers uh in big basin so i think that'll go a long ways with uh, the old timers but you know i do understand that you know some people don't like change um, and then there'll be the LAFCO process where there'll be uh, considerable outreach and discussion uh, through that. And at a, a little later date and time, we will get uh, the executive director of LAFCO 
uh, at a, uh, a big basin meeting to explain the LAFCO process. It's kind of complicated. And I don't want to. I don't want to leave anything out if I try to explain it. Um, but it is a, a long process, and uh, Mr. Sharano, the executive director, has already offered to attend meetings to to start getting information out on that annexation. You know, and again, for the district to supply water outside of our our service area and our sphere of influence, which Big Basin is outside of, uh, it has to be annexed into the district. And that process um, is lengthy. It'll take about 18 months, um, but a lot can be done uh, during that time frame. And again, we'll get uh, Mr. Sharano to uh, explain that process in detail. And, Great. Thank you, and it's important to say that that involves public input. Very much so. Along the way. So there'll be plenty of chances for you to express your thoughts on things, Dan. Um, Bruce Holloway. Hi, I'm a little fumble fingered here. Did I, did I make it work? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I didn't hear your announcement at the start of the meeting. So when I uh, saw Supervisor McPherson speak a couple times on this item, I thought he's an adversarial party uh, because the county has been suing our district. Uh, so when I listened to his remarks, he's, he's offering the uh, support of the Water Resources Department. But meanwhile, there's another county department that's Costing us money every time. Um, every time the attorney has to uh, has to address it. Um, I, my understanding is, if an ordinary house wanted to, a single house wanted to join SLV Water District, even if the water main already exists on the street in front of that house, the cost for one house is twenty thousand dollars approximately. Maybe it's nineteen something. I think, as I recall. Um, when, uh, for example, when the Olympia uh, Mutual Water Association was was annexed by the district, they paid about a million dollars for for fifty houses, uh, which is about twenty thousand dollars a house. Um, and so, I just want to start throwing numbers like that around so that people are aware of what how these how these annexations usually work. Um, for for five hundred houses. $20,000 a house, that would be a $10 million that they would need to raise. Um, and I think somehow you've got to start uh, putting some numbers on this so everybody understands what, what's really being talked about. Um, another thing I wanted to say was that uh, when the Felton Library got built, as I recall, there was a million dollars uh, that the state appropriated. Assembly Member Stone was able to add a million dollars to that. So I, I I hope that uh, I think Boulder Creek has suffered enough because of the fire and everything, and I hope that there can be uh, substantial support from the state. Thank you. Thank you for that. And what, are there any members, other members of the public that would like to uh, speak at this time? Jim Mosher. So thank you, Chairman Hood. Um, I, I um, am in, in support of helping our neighbors and, and I want to echo a lot of what we've heard uh, tonight. And I appreciate the efforts by uh, Supervisor McPherson's office and by uh, Rick Rogers to move this forward. I think my main concern has been partly addressed by some of the speakers tonight. My concern is that um, I would like, as a as a ratepayer in the district, to be hearing from the ratepayer, the um, the residents in the big basin, the ratepayers up there directly, um, and for them to be more active in communicating the need to do this, and for for the for there to be a building consensus up there that um, is is um, actively organized and led by the ratepayers. Um, I'm a veteran of the Felton, uh, Felton merger, um, and we had to do a tremendous amount of organizing to take on a private water district, of course, a huge one, not like the small one you're dealing with. But the owners, the owners of private water districts have very distinct interests from you as a ratepayer, 
And as you join our district, um, it's a very different role that you have. You become owners of the district, as uh, uh, as our uh, Bob Fultz is like to say. <clears throat> it needs for you to be much more active in, the, in engagement. Um, and so I'd like to, I, I'm hoping that through this process that you, there is more leadership from the ratepayers and that this doesn't become an exercise in which government agencies and government officials are the ones who serve as the leadership, because I think that will lead to some uh, bad feelings and some uh, potential ill will uh, down the line when you find out exactly how much this is going to cost. We we raised eleven million dollars in Felton for our merger. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Allison Breeze. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Allison. Oops. Can we let Allison speak, please? There we go. Hmm. Uh, can you hear me again now? We can now. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just hoping that uh, the board or the manager could perhaps address a little bit what the prior two speakers have brought up. Uh, with regards to what the order of magnitude of cost would be for the uh, big basin ratepayers for each individual household. I completely understand that this is very premature and that you don't know numbers yet, but just order of magnitude, are we truly looking at something like each household having to provide $20,000 for this to happen? Um, because I think that that is something that the Big Basin customers need to be aware of going forward very early, what they are to expect, because a lot of people are still struggling after the fires, <laughs> the pandemic, everything going on. And that, I think, will influence and enter into some people's calculations. Okay, Rick, I mean, I, I don't no, want to put that on the spot strongly agree that the, the number one question that most people will have is, you know, cost to them uh, and the cost of water. I mean, Big Basin Water, I think, is only a third of the cost per unit uh, than SLV. There is a lot of concerns on the cost. We need to develop those. And I, I don't want to give a hypothetical because I may be too high, I may be too low, and there, there'd just be a guess. Grant you, you know, our guess may be a little better than somebody else's, but we're, I'm not ready to give that, and I don't want to give a false sense of it's too, too high, too low. That'll be one of our first uh, orders of business is to, to find the funds in order to do the engineering to get uh, costs. And you will get those costs way before, you know, you need to make a decision whether you want to protest the annexation or that you want to uh, move ahead. You know, that's our first... Uh, our first line of business is to you know, to try to get engineering studies. You know, we have uh, we're in for grants right now to do some of the inner tie work between Bracken Bray and Forest Springs that will be used for Big Basin as well. So once we start getting some information, we'll get costs, and then we got to figure out what we're going to get in grant money. Then that grant money will take away from what the homeowners have to pay, but undoubtedly the homeowners will pay something. You know, I doubt it will be able to get 100% of this covered. Um, by other source of funding. So there will be some costs, I just can't tell you. And you've heard other people say that people have paid up to $20,000 on, on uh, consolidations and so forth. Um, the one thing that we do do and we've done in the past that we'll ask the board to do, we will ask the board to waive the connection fee of the $10,000 per connection as you are putting funds into the water system to rebuild. You'd rather see that money go there. So there are some things we can do to keep costs down that we've done in the past, uh, and we will continue uh, in that direction. Okay. Um, Mike, I think we already heard from you. So um, I, I think I'd rather go back if you don't and um, go back to the board now. Um, so Jamie, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I, I understand that we can't, you know, put any numbers around this, but I, I do think we can maybe put a tiny bit of context around 
what those numbers when we get there, you know, will represent, right? I mean, so when um, right now, Big Basin Water customers, they, they, they are customers to a private for-profit water utility, okay? We are a public agency. We are not a for-profit business. Um, and, and so what we have to do and what, what Rick is talking about in all of these studies is determine, one, what the value is of a big base and water company and its assets. And then, two, in addition to that, we have to look at all of the, um, you know, work that has to be done, right, and, and get to some kind of a number around that as well. And then all of that factors into what our if we are going to merge that that water um, company into our uh, district, what are the costs going to be to us? And what does Big Basin as a private for-profit water operator need in order to um, you know, merge the, the business into San Lorenzo Valley Water District? And then we will begin the process once we have those numbers of seeking grants and state support at that level. We'll work with our um, county supervisor who's here tonight to pledge his support to that um, for that. And of course, um, you know, we'll we'll look at uh, what costs may have to be borne um, by the Big Basin Water Company customers as well. So that's just some sort of context for what those numbers represent when we're talking about them. And that's all that I wanted to say. Bob? Uh, yes, um, Rick. I think some other context might might be important. Um, as a as a private company, is Big Basin Water eligible for FEMA? Um, funding for their, to help in their recovery? I have been reaching out to FEMA and I'm going through the, uh, the chain of uh, FEMA leadership and I'm getting, uh, I'm getting all told that because this is a private company that FEMA money cannot, uh, they're not eligible for FEMA grants. However, there's always political pressure against FEMA and, and Cal OES that if we start applying political pressure, we may be able to get them under a late claim, but they're saying it's doubtful. And as soon as the board, if the board authorizes tonight to move forward, we start putting that political pressure on FEMA. Um, uh, but as of it is now, FEMA uh, states that uh, Big Basin is not eligible because it's a private company. I, I mean, I think the, um... You know, these are going to be the the, the finances of, is of course is going to be of paramount importance to everybody in Big Basin Water, and I I don't know that there's any way to sugarcoat this because of the extent of the damage to um, the, the the water facilities there through you know a catastrophic fire that I don't think anybody was expecting would happen in that way. I mean, lightning strikes account for, I think, 3% of the causes of fire, you know, in our general area. Very, very rare. Um, but regardless of which way it went, um, because of the fact that FEMA is not funding private for-profit agencies, the only thing that Big Basin Water could do if they stayed private would be to basically go to the PUC and say, I, I, I need I need money, I need to finance um, this, and therefore the ratepayers are going to have to cover that. One way or the other, uh, I guess my message is whether it's would be through Big Basin Water trying to do the recovery or through us, the, the ratepayers are going to be uh, funding it. Now, what I think the, um, what I think Rick was addressing on the political bargain is that because of the state policy of wanting to see consolidations like this, we are very hopeful that large portions of what would otherwise be your responsibility financially will be covered by grants. I, I, given the magnitude of prices, I mean, you can do some back of the envelope calculations of uh, pipes being put in the ground. I think our most recent number was somewhat around 300 bucks a foot, something like that. Uh, for main lines, probably slightly less for um, uh, dis distribution and feeder lines. Um, you know, the the treatment plants are, you know, one to $2 million, et cetera. These are enormous numbers. And without grant funding, I don't know that this is affordable for anybody um, any longer, given the magnitude of the damage there. So 
that is something I think that that we I I'm speaking for myself. I'm very focused on um, at making sure that we do everything possible to get that kind of, of grant funding and that we ask for that kind of political support from uh, Super Supervisor McPherson, Assembly Member Stone, Senator Laird, and others, all the way up to the governor, to help make this happen. Um, we we do not want to see people. Um, either driven from their place or put into such financial straits that they can no longer afford their home based on this disaster happening. Um, and, and I'm I'm committed to doing everything possible I can and support everything that Rick's doing in that area to make that happen. But but make no mistake, this is going to be an enormously expensive proposition. Uh, and, and by the way, we're facing the same level of um, costs ourselves through um, uh, the damage, though we fortunately do get a lot of that covered by FEMA. One other thing I wanted to mention that I, that I wanted to recognize, I think Ms. Jennings was the one that said that about, well, if we bring our system up to sort of pristine conditions, then do we also pay for everybody else? You know, this is in fact a, a running um, commentary that, that Rick and I have been having over, over a few years. Uh, about that. Mainline funding, uh, that is a lot of the work that we've been doing up until now has all been sort of around mainline and centralized facilities that everybody takes advantage of. And in that case, the policy that we've had up until now has been, yes, everybody has to help pay for that. But the question you raise about distribution lines into neighborhoods and that sort of thing, I think is a very interesting one and something that is worthy of discussion. I'm not, I can't say how I would go on that right now, but I think it is a very, very good question that needs to be resolved as part of this process. Okay, is there any more um, comments by members of the board? Um, if not, would anybody like to make a motion? I'll make the motion, um, but you've read it already, Gail. Would you like um, me to read it again? <laughs> um, I don't know that I need to hear it reread, that's the motion that I would like to make. I think we probably read it. we need to read it into the record just so okay. that then yeah, please. everybody knows. So I'll I'll do that for you. Um, that we are directing the district manager to proceed with exploring possible water system consolidation with Big Basin Water Company, including authorization to incur legal and grant writing expenses within the amount of the district manager's purchasing authority. Period. I'd I'd second that. Okay. Um, any final comments or questions regarding that? Jamie? Um, I was just going to add that I, I hope that um, that this vote, if it, um, if it, it you know, and, and I plan to vote in support of um, exploring the merger with Big Basin Water Company. And I, and I uh, hope that this is a demonstration of our commitment to the relationship, not just with Big Basin Water Company customers, but also with the county. Um, as a good partner going forward. Okay. Uh, Holly, would you take the roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Lois, are you muted? Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Fulz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Okay, we come to our next item of uh, new business, which is the agreement, uh, mitigation agreement with Pacific Gas and Electric. Yes, uh, Chair Mayhood, and I will ask the Environmental Programs Manager to present this, what I consider a wonderful item to the board. Great, thank you, Rick. So the district was approached by PG&E about potential riparian habitat on district property to complete a riparian planting mitigation project in approximately one acre area of riparian and oak woodland habitat located along an ephemeral tributary to Zianti Creek was identified on the district's Olympia watershed. PG&E contracted with ecologist Jody McGraw to create a conceptual restoration plan for the site. The restoration plan entails removing invasive plants and then planting riparian trees, understory plants, and coast live oaks. 
Installing plants within these areas that lack established tree canopy will accelerate establishment of native plants and suppress reestablishment of invasives. The areas that feature an existing native plant canopy will be passively revegetated following the removal of invasive plants. As compensation, the district requested pg and &E to conduct removal of invasive plants, specifically French broom, on other areas throughout the Olympia watershed. Removal costs and maintenance for five years of approximately 5.5 acres was determined to be approximately $101,000. This is an excellent opportunity for restoration on district property at no cost to the district and develop a productive collaboration with pg and &E. The draft agreement and map of the planned area are attached as exhibits. Once the conceptual plan is approved by the State Water Resources Control Board, the document will be made public and brought to the district's environmental community. I'm happy to answer any questions on this item. Okay. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with Mark and he's the chair of the Environmental Committee. Okay, thank you. Um, the Environmental Committee uh, has discussed this in the past uh, and the committee. Um, applauded staff's efforts, and particularly Carly, in moving this forward. So uh, we agree with moving ahead on this. Thank you. Okay. Um, Bob, you're also a member of that committee? Yes, and uh, I, I'd echo what uh, Mark says in that. I have a couple other uh, things. Uh, one question, uh, Carly. The uh, broom removal will be done in compliance with our policy around um, uh, that kind of thing, that is no glyphosate, correct? Correct. Excellent. That is really good to hear. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting that broom um, off of the uh, off of the area. And more importantly, I, I believe by replanting, um, the, the intent is to try to minimize any kind of uh, broom coming back. Uh, correct. Right, so where we'll be replanting is only that one acre area that pg and &E is completing the mitigation project. Yes. Um, but hopefully with the removal of the invasives, we'll start to see some of the natives come back into the riparian areas where we're removing. And hopefully the broom on our neighbors next door won't come over too much. Right. Unfortunately, that's always the danger. Um, no, and I, and I also, I mean, I do want to recognize um, pg and &E for um, being willing to enter into this um, public-private partnership in a way that uh, benefits, I think, everybody. Right. And hopefully this is something that may last uh, longer than even five years, if, uh, if at all possible. I think it would be, a, uh, a, a, I, I'm hopeful that it'll turn out to be a great showpiece for everybody, including pg and &E, relative to environmental stewardship and how well uh, everybody is looking after uh, what is really a unique piece of property in not only our area, but our state and the, and the country. Okay. Uh, Lois, did you have anything you wanted to add? I totally support this item. Okay. Jamie? I, I support this item. I, I wonder if um, they're going to. Uh, well, I support this item. Never mind. Okay. Um, let's go out to members of the public to see if anybody has any comments or questions about this. Uh, Rick Moran. Yes. yes. Uh, Rick Moran from Ben Lohman. And uh, glad to see everybody here. Um, I fully support this habitat restoration project. And I'm particularly pleased to see that the project will be done without the use of herbicides. This project is in good hands with Jody McGraw, who has a long and successful work history with our water district. With the support of our own environmental planner, Carly Blanchard, I'm confident that this will be a successful habitat restoration project. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Any other comments from the uh, public? How about um, Bob, did you have your hand raised? Did you have anything further you wanted to say? Well, I did. I uh, unfortunately we had. Um, I didn't see that Rick was on the list of attendees tonight, and I did want to actually give Rick a lot of credit. <clears throat> excuse me for starting um, this process and focusing on uh, not using herbicides in these kinds of activities. Rick uh, took a lot of slings and arrows in the past 
uh, for that. Um, but ultimately, uh, science and uh, I think good common sense won out. And Rick, thank you very much for being a continuing advocate uh, for that policy. And thanks for speaking in support of it. Okay. Um, we have a motion from the staff to uh, for us to move to authorize the district manager to enter into the attached agreement with PG&E on behalf of the district for riparian habitat mitigation in the Olympia watershed. Would anybody like to move that? I'll move it. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. With that, um, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? Uh, President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. The motion passes. Okay. And with that, we move on to um, the next item, which is the draft conjunctive use plan. Yes, I'll ask the uh, environmental program manager uh, to present this item to the board. Great, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Cole. So the San Lorenzo River Watershed Conjunctive Use Plan, or CUP, was jointly developed by the district and the County of Santa Cruz to identify opportunities for improving the reliability of the district's surface and groundwater resources through conjunctively managing these supplies while also increasing stream-based flows for fish in the San Lorenzo River Watershed. The plan was funded in 2017 by the Wildlife Conservation Board's California Stream Flow Enhancement Program and administered by the county. As part of the grant, two studies, the conjunctive use plan and CEQA analysis were completed. The CEQA initial study mitigated negative declaration or ISMND public review period ended on August 31st, 2021. Significant public concerns were raised during the public review period, which can be seen in the comment letters attached as exhibit A. Therefore, district staff <clears throat> and legal counsel recommend additional CEQA analysis through an environmental impact report or EIR. An EIR is planned to sufficiently address the comments and that were received during the public review period and allow the district to consider revision to the conjunctive use plan to better suit its operations. Further technical studies as required as part of the EIR will also support future environmental permits and state water board actions. The timeline to complete the EIR process is approximately 9 to 12 months. District staff is recommending to continue the CEQA analysis work with Rincon Environmental Consulting, the firm originally brought on to the project to complete the ISMND. Rincon's updated scope of work is attached as Exhibit B. The cost for Rincon to prepare the EIR for the district is $145,000. It's important to note that a fisheries biologist will also need to be brought on board to complete further aquatic technical studies and modeling services. Scope will be brought to the board for approval when ready. Staff is prepared to answer any questions on this item. Okay, um, we'll start um, off with uh, Mark. Yes, um, I have a number of questions related to uh, the strategic approach that we're taking on this. Um, and given that, the, and the fact that the Environmental Committee has not reviewed this at this point, I'd like to uh, consider, instead of the full proposal, a more limited uh, scope at an initial outset so that we might be able to discuss with the committee the uh, a strategic, a more strategic plan as to what we're going to cover during this um, EIR. I fully support moving ahead with an EIR, but I want to know what the scope of it is going to be covering. So, how do we, how can we address that? Yeah, and I, I, um, I do believe that uh, Gina has a, a recommendation um, that kind of sinks to that tune mark. So I, we want to okay. go through everyone's okay. questions first and come back to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Bob, you're also on the Environmental Committee. Yes, I mean, I, I do, Mark, I, I think that's a, a great idea, and I think it's worthy of having a 
a discussion about some of those um, strategic implications here. I mean, you know, from my point of view, you know, what the district is trying to do is get to a point where we can use water from any source at any destination. And by doing so, to be much more efficient and much more um, uh, sensitive to the environmental habitat by, by being able to use water in, in, a, in a more efficient way. And it, it's somewhat disappointing that, um, you know, the end result, which hopefully we'll get to the same end result, but we have to wait another year to be able to start to get there, which means another year of the current operations that we have now. Um, and of course, an additional $150,000, which is basically $20 per um, customer um, to have to do this. So, you know, half of somebody's bill every month um, it, uh, in a month, sorry. So it's, it's disappointing that we have to do it. And, um, but, but I think your approach is probably the best way to get to having to take that a sort of off ramp into a different place than what we had hoped we would get to. Um, so I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Lois? Well, I would like to hear uh, what Gina has to say and Rick Rogers has to say. I, uh, let me, um, I think, uh, let's let Rick talk about this and then hear from, uh, respond to the comments that have made so far and then okay. let everybody else comment before. We... No, that, that, you know, from my perspective, that sounds like a, a good approach. You know, we're moving ahead, um, which is great. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's what will work. And I'm, you know, I'll turn it over to Gina if she wants to uh, explain the approach. Um, so, um, in light of some of the comments that are being raised, uh, what I would recommend as an alternative, uh, to approving the entire Rincon scope of work at tonight's meeting would be to take kind of a more gradual approach and, uh, instead direct the staff to proceed with environmental review of the conjunctive use plan by preparing an EIR. Um, but as a first step, uh, directing the staff to develop a more limited budget with RINCON within the scope of the district manager's purchasing authority solely for the purpose of, de of, of outlining um, the proposed project and alternatives and taking that to the environmental committee for review along with the, proposed, the complete proposed scope of work so that the environmental committee can comment on the proposed, the outline of the proposed project and the alternatives and the, uh, the full scope of work that Rincon has outlined. Um, and uh, once that is done um, and the environmental committee provides input, then it could be reevaluated how the district moves forward with the EIR process. Jamie, did you wanna comment on that? No, I, I'm in support of doing the EIR. I think it's um, it's the safest path forward. Okay. Yeah, I, I I think what Gina, the two-step process is is correct. I mean, we want to clearly move ahead with the um, environmental um, impact statement, but I think um, the EIR. But I I would say that the um, as the first step, we want to develop a not so much a budget with Rincon, but to direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Rincon um, within the limits of his purchasing ability, which is on the order of 30,000, but hopefully will be a lot less. And that this will this contract will be to outline um, a proposed projects and alternatives. Um, and will be brought to the environmental committee. But I think that the, the one way I would sort of diverge from what Gina said is that I, I don't want them to come with a finished product. I think that what we want is the environmental committee to 
be involved early in developing um, an updated list of projects that will be assessed in the EIR. And that that's all I, I, I would state it differently than what you stated it, which made it sound to me like they basically are coming in with a bunch of projects and then, then the um, environmental committee comments on them. I don't know, maybe other people may have different views on that, but that, that's kind of my feeling about it, Mark. Yes, I would like to uh, potentially further amend what we're asking for at this initial stage. Since we recognize that there's going to be uh, a cost for a contract biologist involved in this to do further studies that uh, Carly has just indicated we're not part of uh, RINCON's proposal. Can we get that cost also uh, at this initial stage so that we're aware of what that's going to be also? Okay. You know, Lisa, I think this Lisa is getting estimate. kind of complicated. And so what I'm suggesting is that maybe we divide the question here so that the one thing is, is very clear um, and that we the first thing that we can all agree to, and I'm hoping, is that we direct district staff to proceed with environmental review of the conjunctive use plan by preparing an EIR. And so I, I, I guess I would like to make that as a motion, um, and then we can craft the rest of it separately, um, if, if that's all right with people. Okay, me. I can support that. Okay. Would somebody like to move what I just read then? I'll make that motion. Okay. Second. All right. Um, any comments or questions among the, the board before I go out to the public? Okay. Um, any members of the public like to make a comment um, on the motion that's in front of us? Hearing none and seeing none, um, I'll come back to the board for one last time and not seeing any raised hands. I'll then ask um, uh, Holly to take a roll call vote, please. President Mayhood. Hi. Uh, Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Fultz. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay, the motion uh, passes unanimously. Um, so maybe Mark, would you like to propose um, a motion for how you would like to see the rest of it done? Um, I'd like to make a motion to have staff solicit proposal for the additional biological analysis that will need to be done to support this EIR going forward. Okay. So that the committee can look at that proposal also. Okay. All right. So that that's um that's kind of a, a separate thing. So we can we can go ahead and uh, vote on that too. I think I mean that was something that I noticed when I read the uh, proposal that, that that was not included in the scope of work by Rincon, but it was their report was dependent on it. So I think it would be good if we had that information in front of us before we get too much farther along. So um, I, I think um, if you would move that, I would second that. Yes, I'd like to make that motion. I'll, I'll second it. Any comments or questions among the board on that one? How about among our members of the public? I don't see any. So we'll now go back to our board and not seeing any questions, I'll go ahead and ask for a roll call vote from Holly. President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Fultz. Yes. And Director Smalley. Yes. Okay, so that 
um, leaves the final part that was kind of a little bit messier, which was um, that we uh, develop, um, that we direct the staff to um, enter into a contract with RINCON within the amount of the district manager's purchasing authority. And the contract should um, involve outlining a proposed the proposed projects and alternatives for uh, pr presentation to the environmental committee um, with the goal of arriving at an updated list of projects that will be assessed in the EIR. Is, does that sort of express what you're trying to get at, Mark? Yes, yes, it does. All right. So I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay, any other comments from members of the board? All right, then how about uh, members of the public? Uh, any comments? I don't see any. All right, so Holly, would you please take a roll call vote? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Okay. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay, the motion passes uh, unanimously. So we'll go to our next item of business, which is multiple variance renewals for 2021-22. Yes, thank you, Chair. You have in front of you a uh, request to uh, adopt uh, the one-year um, variance for multiple users. Um, this is pretty much housekeeping we do every year. We have uh, ordinance 43 and 47, which establishes charges for multi, uh, uh, multi single family dwellings on one parcel on one water meter. Um, these are the homes that applied for a variance that the homes are not occupied. The second home uh, staff is recommending that you uh, adopt the resolution um, showing the uh, variance for these uh, parcels as listed. Be happy to take any questions. Okay. Uh, are there any questions from members of the board? <clears throat> Pretty straightforward, I think. I don't see any questions from the board or comments. How about from um, attendees? I don't see any there. Um, so basically, we have uh, a motion that um, we board adopts a resolution that approves a one-year variance from multiple user status for the 30 property owners listed in the attached memo. I'll second. Uh, then could you take a roll call vote, Holly? Neil Mayhood, excuse me, President Mayhood. Hi. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. And Director Smalley? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Um, and so we come to our last item um, of new business, which is Director of Finance and Business Services Recruitment. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, on July 23rd, 2021, the district started the recruitment process for the Director of Finance and Business Services position. Uh, this position is an executive management classification responsible for the complex uh, functions related to the fiscal and business components of the district. Several attempts have been made to recruit qualified applicants for this position. Uh, the district has continually posted job offerings with many different uh, services, uh, Indeed, Press Banner, Water Jobs. We even tried uh, KSCO Radio for the first time. Um, we have received a small number of applicants that did not meet the job requirements. Um, not getting applicants right now is not unique to the district. Um, job openings have uh, reached the highest level on record, uh, while hiring levels have, have stalled. I reached out to other agencies and they're having uh, the same issue. I'm asking the board to consider um, allowing the district to move ahead um, with an executive search firm to help fill the, 
position of Director of Finance and Business Services. However, um, with this recommendation, I'm asking you to approve. However, I'm not ready to run right out and um, start the, the services of an executive search. Some different alternatives have recently surfaced that we'd like to try before moving uh, to an executive search firm. But I would uh, request the board approve if those alternatives do not work out. And with that, I'd be more than happy to, to take any questions. Okay. If I didn't confuse you worse than I already have. Well, these mysterious alternatives, maybe I'd like to hear about what some of those are, but let, let's Lois, Lois, since you're the uh, chair of the budget and finance, let's hear from you first. You're calling on me? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Calling on you in class. <laughs> she, she did it frequently. So is Rick going to tell us what these mysterious things <laughs> are coming our way or not? We're, we're looking at potential in-house um, promotions right now. And we have not exhausted um, that alternative. Um, so I would like to uh, speak with staff and, and look at possible um, in-house recruitment before we go back out one more time. Do I dare ask this question? What about uh, another new person you wanted? Uh, someone executive helper or? Oh, the project manager? But yeah, having, the project manager. We're having extreme difficulty in locating a, a project manager. You know, the obviously the finance manager position uh, is probably of, of a higher urgency than the project manager, just because of the amount of money that we have in the bank and the amount of projects and the ex extreme workload uh, finance has uh, experience from FEMA. Um, that has been incredible this time around because they're entering all of the financial data into a database uh, for FEMA. Um, I have reached out and spoke with people on the uh, project manager and I'm trying to reach out to existing folks at other agencies. And I hate to use the word poach, but I'm trying to entice other individuals to, to come okay. over to the district. Okay, uh, thank you for your information. And uh, uh, you can move on to someone else. Uh, All right. Uh, is, does anybody else like to make a comment on this? Bob? Um, Rick, on this executive search firm, um, you know, I know that things are very different now, um, you know, in the job market, and that probably has impacts on. Um, I'll use the colloquial term headhunters. Um, is this a contingent search or is this a fee regardless of whether they're successful or not? You know, I, I, I haven't got that information from our, our HR staff. I, and until we select one, I don't think we'll know, but I, I definitely understand where you're coming from. Um, it would have to be contingent. Uh, I don't think we would move um, if it wasn't. Could we include that in the motion? You most certainly could, as a, as whoever. Assuming, is. yeah, I mean, assuming that the rest of the board would would go along with it. I, yes, I, I, I would I, be I with that. Yeah, I would be more comfortable with that uh, arrangement. And if that arrangement is no longer feasible in the marketplace because headhunters are not doing contingent anymore, then definitely come back to us uh, on this. Um, but I'm I'm also glad to hear that this isn't something that you're going to pull the trigger on immediately if there are other options that may work out differently. So um, that would be great. Thanks. Are there any comments uh, from the public on this topic? No. Okay. Um, Bob, would you like to state the recommendation the way you would like it? Yeah, let me get to the... Um, I would like to uh, make a motion that the board authorize the district manager to procure the services of an executive uh, search firm uh, to fill the position of director of finance and business services 
not to exceed $35,000 on a contingency basis. I'll second that. All right. Can we have a roll call vote, please, Holly? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fulz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. All right, um, next we have the consent agenda, which has only the single item, the Board of Directors meeting minutes. Does anybody want to pull that? Um, how about any members of the public? No? Okay, and then how about on um, district reports? Any questions from members of the public on district reports? Okay, well, I think we're at the end of our evening. We had a busy night and we still got done at nine o'clock. So good job, everybody. A lot. Uh, <laughs> and thank, thank you. And without, if, with no objections, we are now adjourned. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.